What's up everybody and welcome to this live training. Thank you uh, if you are actually watching this live right now. Uh, hopefully it'll be a lot of fun. Hopefully your boss isn't uh, looking at your computer screen right now. You got your earbuds in. So uh, it looks like you're working even though you're actually working on your tennis games. So before we get going, just let me know in the chat, uh, can you hear me? And where are you joining from? Um, last time we had people from all over the place here in the States, all over, you know, every different state, people overseas. So just let me know, can you hear me in the chat? And uh, where are you joining from? Adam over here, I'm pointing in this direction because Adam Siminski, FYB's co-founder, my best friend from first grade is monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions during the live training, I've got a bunch of pre-submitted questions. Thank you so much for submitting those. Um, but uh, we'll also take questions live uh, if, uh, if something pops up uh, or you just have something that you didn't submit but you, uh, you want asked. So anything coming through yet? Delay? Well, we, we, uh, we can hear you. We got people from Portugal. Portugal. Connecticut. Connecticut. The, uh, ah, DC Portugal. Area. Portugal's exotic. Connecticut is exotic for different reasons. Central uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania from D.C.? Uh, yep. Here in D.C.? Nice. Okay. Melbourne, Florida. Melbourne, Florida. Okay. All over the place. Sounds good. My sister, my sister is actually in Portugal right now. She's about to hike the uh, hike walk, I guess you call the Camino Trail, El Camino. It's like a month long thing. So um, left on Monday. So if you're Catherine, if you're watching this, I know you're not, but if you are, have a good hike. Uh, all right. Well, why don't we, uh, why don't we get started? Today is Professor Will Hamilton. Got the, uh, got the goggles on. Um, only really wear contacts now if I'm playing tennis because uh, just eyes get kind of dry, so glasses are better. All right, so what we're going to do for this live training, again, remember, you can submit questions ahead of time, but I am going to start by answering singles questions, and it's just easier to have hero down here. This is going to be us, villain up here. That's the opponent, and just keeping this configuration, then I'll swap in the, uh, uh, the player icons. Um, all right, cool. So the first question, well, I'll just try and set it up like this. So what do you do if your opponent is returning your serve? And we're going to set this up in the ad court for a very specific reason. But your opponent is returning serve, but the return of serve is sort of short, right? It's a little bit past the, uh, the service line. So it's kind of one of those, like, should I approach the net? Should I just keep the ball in play and wait for a different opportunity? Uh, the person who submitted this question said specifically, she was taught if the ball lands uh, on the service line or in the uh, uh, service box, that's a ball you come to net on. But if it's a little bit past, maybe a foot or two, what should you do? And uh, Hero is an aggressive um, baseliner in this case, and Villain is a counterpuncher. So, this situation in the ad court was exactly what happened in the Wimbledon final match point number two for Roger Federer. What happened was Fed served first serve. Fed hit a first serve that was kind of a body jam on Djokovic. Djokovic's shot, he blocked it, he kind of chipped it back, was right here, landed, so let's say there, it stayed low, Fed moved around, hit an approach shot down the line, and was approaching the net, and then Djokovic hit a passing shot. That was a great passing shot. It landed very close to the line uh, to, save that, uh, to save that match point. So I'm sure, not that I've you know, been researching this particular point a ton, but I'm sure there's a lot of chatter uh, on the internet about what Federer should have done with this return because it was sort of a 50-50 ball. You could make that argument, right? Do you keep it in play? Do you approach the net? Uh, I personally think Fed made the right choice. I think match point, you want to be aggressive, force Djokovic to come up with the goods. He did, but you're making him hit a great passing shot that landed a foot from the line. I think anything that was sort of more here Federer would have gotten a racket on it. One very, very uh, subtle thing, if you go back and rewatch that point, that just uh, uh, emphasizes the importance of positioning in tennis, is Djokovic hit this return, 
and then backed up slightly, like kind of just split step backwards. And that gave him just a little bit of extra time to get to the shot. If you watch him hit the shot, it's a reverse forehand. So it's the forehand that releases above the head. And typically you see players do that, Rafa, Djokovic, Fed, whoever, when they don't have time to rotate and follow through. So because they're not able to rotate, they kind of release the racket over their head. So that just shows how much pressure Djokovic was under. And if he hadn't backed up and moved like this, he probably wouldn't have been able to generate that angle, wouldn't have had as much time. So that little split back gave him the ability to hit that shot cross court. Um, so go rewatch that point if you get a minute because it's just, again, it goes to the importance of positioning in, uh, in tennis. So anyway, to bring it back to the original question of what should you do on a, uh, on a ball like this, I think in this case here, you can make an argument for running around hitting a forehand but then driving it uh, back cross court like this and then waiting for an even shorter ball that'll tail back into you and then you can approach on that one. Villain's now been moved off the court here so the approach shot down the line doesn't have to be quite as good. Uh, so I would say in this situation in the, uh, in the ad court that could be certainly something you can try if you have trouble hitting quality approach shots against, uh, you know, again, uh, just quality approach shots when the ball is, uh, is low. You might be wondering why didn't Federer do this? Uh, again, it was match point down. I love taking the initiative. Also driving it from over here to Djokovic's backhand gives him an opportunity to hit to a lot of open court. Djokovic has got uh, the best backhand probably ever. So uh, again, I think Fed made the exact right move, make the guy come up with a good shot, and he, uh, he just did. Uh, one thing here to come back to the original question is you could also make a case for not approaching in this situation because you don't want to approach often to a forehand because they can hit that dipping shot cross court. So if you put, uh, if the situation were reversed like this and you get this low ball here, then the uh, approach shot is a lot better because you don't have to worry about the dip or cross court as much. So. Uh, in this situation, on that 50-50 ball, I almost always would go forehand to backhand. As a general rule, approaching the net, you want to approach off forehand and you want to hit it at the backhand. So if you can do that uh, and you get, again, that 50-50 short ball, if it's a forehand, approach at the backhand, cool. Uh, you should be good to go. Uh, obviously, though, if you're over here, then you're kind of exposing yourself, so then you might not do it. So uh, there's a lot of nuance on that answer, but hopefully that was helpful. Uh, how are we doing in chat? Good. We have one question so far. All right, cool. Is it a singles question? It is. Okay, cool. That gives me time to erase. <laughs> you, can, you can, yeah. Sure. Uh, the question is from Gennaro. Uh, what up? And the question was, how can I try to move up the court closer to the net without my opponent placing it wide past me? The approach shot he's hitting is cross court says so normally that shot gets either too wide or the opponent gets it past me. Uh, Gennaro, are you hitting a forehand or a backhand? Where are you hitting it? Are you hitting it to their forehand? Are you hitting, what shot are you hitting forehand or backhand? And are you hitting it uh, to, uh, to their forehand or backhand? That's an important piece of information. I should have put a, a sword and shield up here too. So I'll just wait for. Well, why don't you go ahead and take another pre-submitted question while we wait for a response? All right. Well, this is the uh, this is the musical interlude, so to speak, where I actually draw the icons I should have drawn earlier. All right. Cool. Oh, my phone works this way. All right, Hero, let me see, I don't have a name on this one. All right, cool. So the question, huh? <laughs> We've got to work on our communication. Indeed. What should you do when home base isn't working against your opponent? 
So in this case, Hero is a counter puncher and, uh, no, excuse me. In this case, Hero is an aggressive baseliner and Villain is an all court player. So all court players are very, very difficult to play because they can hit any shot. They're very talented. So sometimes you're like, well, where do I find uh, a weakness against them? So I'm not gonna go over the deets with home base right now because uh, I've covered it elsewhere, just in the interest of time. But you're in this outside ground stroke rally right now. You've got sword versus sword. And what is happening to Hero, again, aggressive baseliner, is Hero is pulling Villain off of the court. But Villain, from this position, is able to hit both down the line like this and hook it cross court like that. And so by pulling him off the court, it actually really exposes Hero because there's that down the line they gotta watch and then there's the uh, heavy angle cross court uh, they have to watch. And again, that's all court players can pull this off. So the point we need to take uh, uh, away here is you know, not all plays work all the time, right? There's a reason we put 41 of them into the singles playbook is because sometimes your go-to play, home base, whatever, just isn't going to work. So then you need to have another play you can go to. And home base actually is a good one to use against all court players often because you force them to take the risk, then you can counterattack. But again, this particular all court player doesn't seem to have a problem. So what you can do instead is use a play called Trench Warfare. And this is a play that Rafa uh, is great at running. So Trench Warfare, basically just imagine that there's like a little trench behind the baseline, you know, five feet back, something like that. And the goal is for you to back up and at the same time push uh, Villain uh, way back into their trench by hitting uh, high, uh, you know, heavy topspin, loopy, whatever balls that push Villain back, get him off the, uh, the baseline. And from this position, Villain back here really can only hit through the court. They can't hurt you off of the court. And what you do is you just keep directing your fire back here. A good target to aim for is like right here over more towards the shield just because that side's less likely to hurt you. And then you wait for them to try and attack by hitting an angle like, uh, you know, like, like this, let's say. And then from here, you can move over and now Villain has given you the angle to counterattack, right? No one saw that. Has given you the angle to counterattack, whether cross court or up the line like that, uh, if you got it. So kind of similar where home base, you were, you were pulling Villain off the court and then it actually allowed them to generate angles. Well, it's the same thing with trench warfare where you wait for them to try and generate an angle. You wanna make sure as much as possible, come out of your trench, move forward, because that gives you a better angle. And then you can, uh, uh, you can get them on the run. Actually, in this case, you would just be setting up, you would stay there if they went over there and try and set up, uh, set up the red zone. So that would be how you could uh, switch to a different play if uh, home base uh, isn't, isn't working. But again, it just goes to show you need to have more than one play because if, you know, how many times have you gotten to a match and, you know, game plan A isn't working, well, you need to go to game plan B, sometimes C, to find the right uh, play based on, uh, based on villain. So did, uh, was it Giuseppe? Maybe yes. Gennaro. Or? Gennaro, exactly. That's exactly what I said. Gennaro got it the first time. So how is it, was, the, was the question clarified? Yes, so okay. he was saying it's um, his forehand to the opponent's backhand, cross court, and his opponent is able to get the ball wide on him as he approaches. So okay. How does he get in closer? Okay, so it's his forehand approaching, but and it's they're able to get it. Uh, cross court. So, so he's over here. Side out forehand. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it sounds like he might actually be coming from red zone, and then, um, and then. Uh, they're able, he's, the villain's able to generate an angle at passing shot. Either an angle wide or an angle down the line. Okay, okay, but cool. it's getting past him. Okay, cool, it's getting past him, okay, cool. So, uh, we'll just assume, yep, we're gonna assume red zone uh, here. And this marker. So you're coming to net and you're approaching with your forehand, we'll assume in this case you're coming out of the red zone 
and you've got forehand, you're attacking villain's shield, but villain is able to pass you. So one of the things you often see in a situation like this, where you're approaching off your sword, off your forehand, is players try and angle that approach shot off of the court like this and follow it in. But from this situation, even though it's the shield, what ends up happening is you create angles for villain to pass you with, right? You got the angle like this over there. And then when they're off the court like this, they're actually hitting into the court. So they have a lot more window to get that ball by you if you're approaching off the court uh, like this. So instead, the play you would want to use is an approach play that we call the bulldozer. And what you're doing is you're simply approaching basically at this target right here over towards the shield, but it's just a heavy ground stroke towards the shield that, you know, we call it the bulldozer because you're trying to run the person over. But what you're doing in this case, if you, and again, you want to come with pace, you got to hit a good shot. Uh, you're not trying to hit an outright winner or blow them off the court, but you are trying to come with some pace is from here, the angles are much more limited, right? And in particular, the down the line, now this shot for villain, if they try and get it by you, if they catch it late, the ball tails off the court, right? See how they're hitting off the court now versus into the court? That's a, a really big difference, uh, uh, which just a subtle change in where you're hitting your shot, which obviously influences uh, villain's positioning. They can't hit this dipper, so what you're more likely to get is passing shots like this that you're going to be able to get a racket on. Now, in a situation like this, what's more likely to happen is you might get like a volley that you can't quite hit an outright volley winner off of. And in that case, your next volley, you just hit it right back behind them because they're probably going to be trying to cover this. So you want them to go this way, stop, turn around. So they're going this way and they have to stop. And they're almost 100% going to hit a lob. Uh, and if you've ever faced that situation where you're running to cover the open court, you have to stop, turn around, hit a backhand, you probably lob that ball a lot. So you'll probably get a lob, and then that's the one you can hit to the open court and put away. So Giov Giovanni? Gennaro. Gennaro, exactly, exactly what I said. Gennaro, uh, hopefully that was helpful. Uh, just let me know in the comments. Um, any other questions? I need like a musical inner, or not a musical, like something to a race, you know, like something to happen while I'm erasing so there's not just uh, random dead time. How was your day? Was it good? Sure, we have a question from Peter. And he says, you talk about the practice court being broken. Can you provide an example of a better way to practice to prepare for a match? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the uh, practice court being broken line is a, is a line used by Craig O'Shaughnessy. And the reason he says that is because on the Pro Tour, somewhere between like 60 and 70% of points, it actually like filters down. Uh, it's very consistent at our level. Uh, 60 to 70% uh, of the points are four shots or less. And what that means is you're hitting a serve and a first shot, and your opponent, uh, villain, is hitting a return and a first shot. Or obviously you could be hitting a return for a shot if villain is serving. So the, the way to practice it is, you know, most people go into practice and they're just rallying all the time, uh, just, you know, hitting from the baseline. And what you should do instead is practice serve, uh, serve plus one, that play, serve followed by a, a, a sword, and uh, return plus one are the, are the big ones you want to focus on. So really you basically want to start by focusing on the beginning of points, uh, which is just something people don't pay a lot of attention to. So anything you can do with your serve, uh, or your return uh, is a great uh, is a great way to go. And there's obviously a million drills uh, you can figure out related to the, or like on YouTube or elsewhere. I'm trying to think of like what um, uh, what my favorite one for the serve is. I mean, I basically I would I would uh, practice hitting. You know, if you have a willing partner, practice hitting uh, like your favorite serve, and then just working as hard as possible to make that next ball a forehand. And maybe just play like practice points so it's it's real time. All right, we got. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, this is the uh, uh, this is like the lefty uh, edition because uh, this live training. I got so many questions about uh, playing uh, as a lefty against lefties. So I am left-handed. So we will uh, 
We'll talk about that for a second. This thing like snaps to the top whenever I close it. All right, cool. Do that, all right, cool. Hero is a southpaw, a lefty villain. We don't care what villain is other than the fact that villain is, uh, is right-handed. So there's this question of the red zone, which is kind of where you're always trying to maneuver yourself uh, during a point because it gives you an advantage, basically a, 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 an overwhelming advantage. You're gonna win most of those points. And I diagrammed it uh, in, a, in a past video for a righty-righty matchup. But what happens when you have a southpaw down here, which means the sword and the shield are reversed, right? If it's a right-handed player, shields over here, swords over there. So you have swords cross court, you have shields cross court. But now, of course, you got sword cross court and shield. You got sword cross court and shield. What does the red zone look like? Well, it's going to be... Uh, Pretty similar, I guess you could say. You got the imaginary line coming out, which will, you know, uh, if it crossed that line, outside ground stroke. If it doesn't, uh, it's an inside ground stroke. But you're going to get hero down here hitting cross court. So it's the longest part of the court, right, at villain's shield. And, um, you know, it's very difficult for villain to take that down the line. So we're basically just going to take the doubles alley, multiply it, maybe even a little bit more and eliminate it. It's not something that we're worried about villain hitting to. And you might be saying, well, Will, you know, balls over here are outside uh, ground strokes for hero in this case. And that is true, but because it's the sword, we're not deleting as much court. You might take like half of the doubles alley and then remove that. So there's still a little window that villain might not cover. But in this instance, the thing that makes the red zone so powerful for a southpaw is that this is just a natural cross-court rally. It's very easy to get into this. Hero doesn't really have to work in this case. This is just, okay, I'm just hitting cross-court at, uh, you know, at, villain's, uh, at villain's shield. Whereas, you know, if there's a righty down here, you kind of have to maneuver around and turn a, a shield into a sword to set that up. So there's a little bit more work involved. And it's one of the reasons Rafa is so difficult to beat is he, his forehand, that heavy topspin ball that kicks up, is very difficult to escape the red zone in this case because anything cross court, you know, you're still in the red zone because it goes to uh, a hero in this case's sword. So you basically are left with trying to check out and go down the line, which is just, you know, a, I still have sword over there, uh, shield. Um, it's very, very difficult to do anything left hanging here. You know, the thing about lefties is we see this all the time, so we actually have pretty good cross-court backhands. We can step in and take those early, and even though we're going at the sword, we can angle them off the court. We can really do a lot with them. So that's what the red zone looks like for a southpaw, and there's a lot of just natural advantages for a southpaw uh, given just the geometry of the court and how this uh, sword and shield matchup work out. We need Jeopardy music, I think, Adam, for the, uh, for the eraser part. Holistopedia Hol said, how about something for the lefties out there? So I think we might have just covered a little of that. Okay. Oh, that was just, he was just saying, how about, how about something for the lefties? There's more. Ah, okay. Nope, I'm not going to take that. So George Hartwell says, I still don't know what the red zone is. Do you want to do... Uh, you know, George, there's another video uh, that we've we've done that you can find on our channel, on our YouTube channel. It's just FYB2000. Well, you're, you're probably on it right now. Um, and, uh, and we cover it there. So uh, in the interest of just not covering the same real estate twice uh, for these live trainings, uh, you can just check that out. Um, but just check it out like afterwards. It's, it's pretty easy to find. It's probably like we released it like within the last week. And the title is like how Federer or how Djokovic avoids the red zone against Fed, I think is the title. I think I highlighted the names of the people who submitted this and it got like removed in Google Docs. Like the highlight got removed on this thing. That's kind of weird. All right, 
cool. All right, so this is a this is a this is a good one. All right, actually, I'm going to put that back. So this is a question that uh, and a problem that I've actually faced a lot uh, as a southpaw, and I believe it was Kelly who asked this question. Kelly and Colin, I might be wrong about that, but it's a very very similar situation, and basically. It's, I'm a southpaw, I'm going sword cross court at the shield, I'm using the battering ram, but villain is able to either hit a good shot down the line, like this, or I'm assuming if you pull them off the court, they're able to really generate an angle and pull me off the court, and then the next shot comes over here on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the shield here. And, the, and the, uh, that's, that's a very big problem. The thing I tend to face, I have a particular buddy who will just keep sneaking into his shield corner and then try and hit forehands and take control that way. Uh, so in any of these cases, how can you uh, defend against this and still keep what should be an advantage, right? This is the red zone for a southpaw uh, typically. So how do you still maintain that advantage? And the answer is to modify uh, the battering ram a little bit. So what you're going to do in a situation like this is when you get a ball somewhere in this area of the court, right? Remember, you're going to turn it into a sword. With the standard version of the battering ram, you just keep hammering away at the shield. But something in here, you know, and maybe even towards like you know, somewhere there, it's going to depend on your skill set, you're actually going to drive it at the sword over there. You've got to hit a good shot, right? It's got to be an aggressive shot. You're not trying to hit an outright winner. Aim for a big target, just sort of the middle of the deuce box over there. But you want to get villain on the run. And what you're going to do here after you hit that is you're going to slide over there, right? This is probably going to be cross court. This is an outside ground stroke for Villain. You're not expecting this down the line. You're expecting the ball to come back cross court. And you want to make sure your next shot is a sword. And then with that next shot, you drive it over in the shield corner. And now you've got Villain on the run hitting a shield. So in this case, we're not worried about the down the line. We're not worried about an angle cross court. What you're probably going to get here is some kind of short ball, then you can step in, use an approach play. Uh, if they hit another shot through the middle there, then you might drive it over there. It's sort of up to you. It, it, you can do either one, right? And this is something that Rafa does all the time because if Rafa just kept using the battering ram but he only hit things over there, well, then players are eventually going to get a little bit grooved and be able to uh, navigate the ball around the court a little bit better. They'll be able to escape the play. So Rafa will often attack the sword to get uh, his opponent hitting a running shield. This is absolutely something you want to uh, do as well. Again, the trick is like there's, you know, figure out an imaginary line, sort of some barrier. It could just be in between the, uh, uh, you know, center hash mark um, and the single sideline. Like just right in the middle where you'll go over here. But outside of that, you want to send it back cross court because otherwise it's too much risk. Uh, and you might, uh, you might uh, end up missing or just getting yourself wildly out of position. But this is a great modification of the battering ram to, uh, to keep it effective when Villain's got a particularly good shield. So, questions, comments, concerns? At the moment, no. At the moment, people are at work. They're, uh... Gennaro does have one more question okay. if you want to take it, but... Sure. The question is, how do you handle a high ball to your one-handed backhand without slicing it and therefore allowing the opponent to approach closer to the net? Uh, I answered this question in the last live uh, training, Gennaro. Uh, so if you go back, there's, we've, we've turned them into like uh, shorter videos. So I believe that video is live. If not, we'll release it in the next couple days. Um, but, but I've answered that one before. Basically, uh, I'm just going to give you the short answer here. I think the assumption was they're coming to net after they hit a high ball. Um, and 
instead of you trying to loop it back, you would try and drive it, but land it short so it kind of lands at their feet if they're coming in. Uh, and that way they would pop it up and then hopefully you'd be able to, um, you know, step in and, and pass them on the next shot. But we'll release that, we'll release that video if we haven't already. I can't remember if we've released it yet. All right, let me see. That is a good one. So now villain is the southpaw. Hero is a serve volleyer, but a right-hander. I have to invest in, uh, I think we need to invest in some new markers, Adam. Dodgers fans out there? <laughs> Nationals, Washington Nationals, for those of you, our home team, uh, pulled out a big win yesterday. I don't want to rub it in, but we were down 3 nothing, and then we ended up scoring seven unanswered. All right, <laughs> let me see. All right, here. Hero is a servant volleyer, a player who just likes to move forward a lot. Villain is a southpaw, so a lefty. So we've got the forehand, the sword over here. Uh, the, uh, the configuration of sword, sword and shield is reversed. So the situation Hero is running into is they are hitting a uh, shield, uh, a slice approach shot that stays low, and they're following that to net. And Hero, or excuse me, Villain's passing shot is kind of a high-ish uh, ball down the line that Hero is trying to volley. High, it's a high backhand volley. Hero tries to volley it into the open court like this, but Villain's got a great running forehand, heavy topspin, and can pass him down the line or hit a dipper cross court. Uh, and they've got the angle here, and they've obviously got open court that isn't, uh, you know, Hero's correct positioning point is there for this passing shot, and it's unlikely that Hero is going to be in position by the time uh, Villain gets to that ball. So what can uh, what can Hero do instead? And the answer is, so you get this high, you come back to this high uh, backhand volley. What I would suggest in this case, especially if Villain is conditioned for you to volley it over here, is just hit the volley right back down the line because hero or villain's gonna be moving this way, they're gonna stop, turn around, this is a backhand, they're probably gonna lob that next shot and then you just hit an overhead to end the point. So it's kind of like similar to what we were talking about before where you wrong foot someone and they, uh, you know, they're going this way, have to turn around and pop it up. So that's the exact same situ uh, situation you, you uh, get in this case. So I would just change where I hit that volley and you should, uh, you should get an easier ball that you can do something with on the next shot. One was easier to erase. <laughs> All right, let's see what we get. I think we've got, that was probably, yep. Okay, that was the, any other singles questions actually? Yes, Kathleen okay. has a question. Hi, Kathleen. How should I play a frustratingly consistent moon baller that hits everything 10 feet over the net and the rallies last forever? Okay, so Kathleen, are you, what's the configuration here first of all? Are you, um, are, are you right-handed or left-handed? Why don't you just do it assuming right-handed? Assuming right-handed? Okay. So I'm just going to put this person back as a, uh, as a righty. And it sounds like Alan X has essentially the same question. What do you do against a player who hits deep balls constantly with no pace? I find it hard to be aggressive to hit those balls. It is hard to be aggressive. Um, so without knowing more of the nuance... Uh, and he says they're not moon balls, they're deep slices that sit up. 
with pace and you have to produce with no pace and you have to produce everything yourself. So those might be slightly those different. Those are slightly different. Yeah, those are slightly different questions. Um, yeah, no, 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 no. I'm trying to think of which one to answer first. Because we've already talked about we have a, uh, we have serve plus one against a pusher is a video we have on our channel. So that would be how uh, Kathleen, I would recommend you serve against. So the trick, the, the one of the, the main things is like, don't even get into a rally because once you're in a rally, what you're describing is essentially the trench warfare play. Pushers love trench warfare because it's hard to get out of, right? It forces you to hit a series of good shots. So the trick is not even to get into uh, a rally to begin with. So it's very much focused on the serve plays and then the return plays. So to help Kathleen, like we already have a video, like I said, on serve plus one. So I'm trying to think of the uh, the right uh, return play uh, that uh, that you can use in this case. So um, I'm just trying to think. There's there's a number of them. So I'm trying to think of one that's like immediately uh, actionable. All right. Why don't we Why don't we do it? This This one is probably like more interesting or something you haven't heard of. Let me put it that way. So remember, put, yep, 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 yep. I'm getting direction from, from Adam. Adam is keeping me on, uh, on task. So villain is a pusher and is just moonballing you to death, right? You get in these long rallies and it's just, it's like 50 shots long and you have to hit five good shots in a row to, to win the point. So how do you handle this situation? Well, you don't even want to get into a long rally to begin with because once you're in it, very hard to get out of it. So when we talk about returning serve, what is a, a, a play you can use? Well, what you can do is, let's take the ad court in this situation. So the pusher is gonna serve and then immediately start backing up to get back into their trench, right? They like to hang out way back there. They get a ton of time. They get more court to work with to hit these high loopy balls that then push you back into uh, you know, your, your imaginary trench. So first thing we need to re recognize, push is gonna back up as soon as you hit that serve. So from the uh, ad court over here, whether you're hitting a forehand or a backhand, what you can do with your first shot is hit a slice there. So a low slice, not trying to hit it deep because what you're trying to do is get villain to go like that to get to it and you get them here. So from inside the court like this, it is hard to hit, it is harder to hit moon balls to push you back. So what you're probably gonna get in this case is something like that, right? Moon ballers by definition can't generate great angles. They're not gonna like hook you off the court. So you should look for something in this area of the court. Now the reason you're going down the line here is to get that cross court so that you then have a sword on your next shot, and your next shot is just going to be one of your standard uh, forehand, standard swords through the middle of the court like this. Because this shot would be a bad shot, wouldn't be effective if Villain was back there ready for it. But they're not, they're right here, and from here, Villain has to move back to hit this thing. And the hardest shot in tennis is to move back to hit a backhand, right? That is going to be a short ball if they don't outright miss it, but it's not gonna push you back. It's gonna land short. You can continue to move forward and you can uh, approach the net, hit a quality approach shot. Might be an outright winner. Might, uh, you know, they might get a racket on it, but give, you know, they'll hit a weak passing shot that you can volley away for a winner. So that, um, hopefully that, uh, that answers the question for how you would handle returns is the trick with a pusher is to push them back, I mean, or, or excuse me, uh, pull them in and do it early so that they're uh, not already back in their trench and then you can push them back uh, because it's on your terms and not, uh, and not theirs. So that can be super effective. But once, you know, again, once you guys are back like this, it becomes a lot more difficult. It becomes a lot more difficult to hit short and keep your ball low um, so we're trying to avoid this situation altogether. So any more singles questions? Yeah. All right, cool, cool, cool. How do you uh, counter someone who puts massive backspin 
on the ball. I need a little bit more specifics than that. Hitting to be able those spinning balls harder, more aggressively, what would you suggest? I need like who I need like a scenario. So like if some so the question is like if someone's hitting with a ton of backspin, what do you do against it? I need a little bit more context to uh, from the person asking to to give you like a decent answer. Yeah, you, they can always submit it. Yeah, you can always submit it for 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 the next uh, next live training we do, or or just or just if you can jump in in the next, uh, we'll give you thirty seconds. Um, Adam, how was your day? People submit questions ahead of time. Oh, you, uh, are you on our email list? We I send out an email typically. Sorry, that's a good. <laughs> just submit a question. How do I do that? I don't know. I haven't told you. Um, if you're on our email list, I typically send an email being like, "Hey, we're going to do a live training," and then you you know there's a link in the email. If you're not on the list, you can come back to. Uh, fuzzyyellowballs.com and there's you can sign up for our email list somewhere there but give it another hot second to uh, if there's a follow up on the on the slice because I think some of it might be like a technically related question you want to answer Al, uh, Alan's question which was sort of similar to Kathleen but he's saying that they hit deep slices that have no pace um, you know and so how do you counter that sort of like it's not a moon ball but it's a deep slice that kind of just floats all the way back and lands near the I, w- I would do I would do similar to what I just said there for Alan's question uh, get them hitting slices when they're moving backwards because then it won't be slight it won't be deep anymore so off the serve off of one of their shots you can pull them in and then push them back with the next shot okay I think that would be all of the live questions then for singles all right cool we will do a uh, set change. Turner's partner and return. All right, cool, cool, cool. Probably, do we want to eliminate the swords and shields and the hero villain? Nah, heroes. Is there an E on this? I think there is, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, for those of you who don't know, I'm dyslexic, so spelling is not, uh, I have many talents, I like to tell myself, spelling and marker selection is not one of them. Uh, whatever, it kind of works. All right, let's see what we got. It's a multi-part question and answer. <laughs> What's up? Nothing. Very engaging answer. <laughs> Look, most people are at work, so this is an opportunity to like actually do what you're supposed to be doing right now. When is a good time to return serve and follow your return to the net? So let's say you're right here and villain hits a serve and I've reversed the icon, so we're going to start that over. Um, This is what happens in real time, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) I saw out of the corner of my eye, you were like, "Uh, I think these icons are messed up. All right. One take, Tony. That's a Saturday Night Live sketch for those of you who haven't seen. It's actually a good, great sketch. I got to look that up. All right, let's try this again. What do you do when you are returning serve and you're trying to decide, you know, should I follow my return to net? And it's actually a uh, relatively nuanced situation. And the first question I would ask is, is the server serving and volleying or serving and staying back. If the server is serving and volleying, what can happen is they come in, you hit a return, you follow your return to the net, and very often they can hit a volley that's gonna be kinda at your feet, right? Because 
they're going to have an opportunity to, you know, maybe volley around the service line, but you're probably going to be in no man's land. So the chances of you popping this ball up are significantly uh, higher, or there's at least a decent chance it's going to happen. So I would be pretty careful in this case. Obviously, a ton of it depends on the quality of, uh, of your return um, and, uh, you know, how much they can do with that with that volley, but a good alternative is you actually uh, stay back in this case and you let your partner clean up if you hit a uh, if you hit a good return. So what would happen is you get the serve coming in, you would hit a return, and when the return's coming over here, so basically the returner's partner is going to hold position until the ball gets by the service partner. Once it does, then this person would move like this, and then right before the server's about to hit, like right before they're about to hit the ball, they would look to see if the server is bending down to uh, hit a volley or if their racket is up here. If the racket's up here, they're going to just hang out and uh, kind of brace for impact. But if the server, the racket is going down, then as soon as they're about to hit, I would just... Uh, move into the middle of court, and this ball is almost certainly going to come back cross court, and you volley it and put it away. And if they don't get it, then the returner's partner would retreat back here. Server continues to close, but then the returner in this case can uh, be here and then rip another ground stroke and try and set uh, their partner up to uh, uh, to pick off the next shot. So that can be sort of an interim step where you're still your team is still being aggressive and trying to get the net player involved. The net player just isn't you. You're hanging back as the returner trying to set up uh, your partner by ripping ground strokes. Now, the other thing that can happen, let's actually just reset this stuff. All right, here we go. So what happens if you, as the returner, want to come to net after your return and the server is staying back now. Well, this is a situation where there's a couple things you need to look at, right? Is uh, do you want to return, or excuse me, do you want to return and approach right away? Um, if, you can, if you can do that on a second serve, that tends to work better. On a first serve, that's going to be more difficult. On a second serve, a lot of the time, you can take a good swing at the ball. But then the question is, what type of return should you hit? If you drive your return, normal ground stroke, that actually gives the server a lot of options. You know, if we work, we worked with Martina Navratilova, you might have seen um, some of our segments with her, but one of the main things she said, she said, if you hit a shot, kind of a standard ground stroke, or a volley that is deep and kind of high, waist high, this person can do a lot with it. They can go down the line, they can hit a cross court, they can lob you. So there's a lot of options, and, you know, at least the folks I play with, a lot of them have great swords. So if they get a look at it, you're sort of like, I don't know what's going to happen here. An alternative can be to, especially if you can step inside the uh, baseline, is to hit a, is to chip and charge, right? And leave it low here. Particularly against players, if they're staying back, right? If they're serving and staying back, they probably don't like to come to net. So if you pull them in and you're able to get into reasonable court position, then this shot, they're going to have to hit up on it. And then that gives you an opportunity, either your partner or you, to hit down on your next shot. So one of the pieces of advice, just generally speaking, uh, when you're deciding, should I come to net, is how do I orchestrate this so that the volleys I'm hitting, the volleys my partner are hitting, we are hitting down on the ball. So in other words, to think about it is, are the volleys we hit going to be uh, when the ball is above the net? And then how do we set it up so that all the volleys villain is hitting are below the net? So they have to hit up. And then that, of course, by hitting up, that means we can hit down on those balls. So that's sort of the chess game with doubles, right, is how do you orchestrate all that stuff? Um, so it's a, little bit, uh, it's a little bit nuanced, right? It goes back to uh, when I talked about if this person stays back, right, let's say you drive that return and they now have a, a sword, well, they can probably dip it. Right? They can get that ball down low at your feet, and then that gives their partner the opportunity to pick off anything you just hit back. So 
there's a lot of, doubles is actually really, really complicated um, in many respects because you're trying to figure out all these you know, little nuances, hitting up, hitting down, um, and just finding the weak shots that you can exploit. So that was, the, uh, that was the return question. Any doubles questions? If you're watching live, ask a doubles question. Or don't, just hang out. Pretend like you're working. I won't tell your boss if you don't. All right, cool, we're gonna reverse this now because hero is typically blue. What do you do when you and your partner are two back and you've got villains two up? So the first thing to recognize in this situation is you're gonna lose most of these points. This is just superior court position and uh, you have to hit great shots to win the point. They don't just by virtue of their court position and all, a lot of these volleys are gonna be hitting down on the tennis ball. So the trick, uh, there's two things you can do in this case uh, that work quite well. First is just direct most of your fire uh, through the middle of the court and try and get the ball to dip so they have to pop their volleys, uh, pop their volleys up. But from, from this uh, situation here, they can't generate angles to hurt you with. So you basically just direct all your fire here. You keep hitting it there, not necessarily trying to hit an outright winner, but you're just trying to get, you know, keep going there until they pop something up. Then you can step in and uh, maybe hit, hit it by them. And then the second uh, piece of advice is, and you have to identify this ahead of time, is so you got four volleys up here, right? You got uh, for the returner in this case, you got the sword and the shield. And then for the returner's partner, you got the sword and the shield, right? So there's four volleys um, uh, that could be hit in that instance. Chances are, one of those four is gonna be significantly weaker than the rest. So uh, this, this uh, was actually a, a cool way of framing it. I learned from my buddy, Jorge Capistani, who's a great coach. But he basically was like, you know, let's take it in the volley context. If you're at the 4-0 level, right, chances are one of these volleys for these, you know, one of these three, uh, one of these four volleys is gonna be a 3-5 level volley. So your job is to just figure out where is that three, five level volley. And then you, in this case, and honestly, in most cases, not all cases, but in many cases, you would direct your fire at that three, five uh, level volley. So in this case, maybe it's the returner's partner over here. You would just go at the, um, go at the shield over there. You wouldn't go in the middle. You just go and send everything here because it's just significantly weaker. So that would be something you'd have to figure out over the course of the match. but. If you don't have that information, start here. As the match evolves, you'll probably figure this out. Then you would target it wherever it might be. Any cues, any cues? Everybody is hard at work, man. This is an industrious group. <clears throat> Rafa fan number one. Yes. The number one Rafa fan, huh? By the way, we've got three more pre-submitted questions I'm going to tackle today. So if you do have questions, answer them now. Because once I knock these out, uh, we're going to go start preparing for the Nationals playing tomorrow. Yep. Got to get got to get ready for that. Uh, and the question was just simply who decides who serve like um, you know where the serve is going, the server or the partner at net. Um, that's a good question. Uh, <clears throat> so who did? So yeah, the, the the question is just who decides. Like, pff, that's not England. <laughs> don't try and don't try and talk don't try and talk too uh, too fast. In a doubles match, where or who rather decides where the serve is going? The answer is you can do it either way. When I was in college, the server's partner would often signal, say you know it would be uh, three for T, uh, one for wide, two for body, and then fist would be a kick serve to the backhand. So that's one way to do it. Uh, a lot of the times, especially if you're playing with a new partner, you're not going to be like doing signals like that. Is you might, you know, if you're serving, you might just tell your partner ahead of time, like, "Hey, this is my favorite serve on the ad court," or "This is, or excuse me, deuce court." This is my favorite serve on the ad court. Uh, the thing that's probably more helpful is 
uh, based on your experience to say, when I sit, hit my serve here, it typically goes there, right? So when I serve wide, it typically comes down the line. Or when I serve wide, it typically comes back cross court because that information is important for your partner because if they see the wide serve, they might actually pinch to the middle to try and put that ball away. So you can do it either way. I think, I think the key, uh, whether it's hand signals, whether it's you know pre-planning ahead of time, whatever is just communication uh, in one way or the other. Uh, and you should, you know, that should go, that should work just fine. A lot of time when I play, I just hit whatever. I don't even tell my partner what I'm gonna do. I just hit the serve and you know, I, I just like be aggressive up there. And you sort of say that and um, they can kind of read the situation and go from there. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, oh, here's a good one. A very lob questions. All right, we're gonna do it uh, this way just because it's a little bit easier. What do you do if you are, um, is that actually, yes, okay, here we go, cool. So what do you do if your team is serving and the returner immediately lobs that ball over the server's partner? What can you do other than tracking that ball down and then just re-lobbing um, you know, that ball back? Is there something you can do that's a little bit more aggressive? Uh, and the answer is yes, there's a couple things you can do. So the first thing you can do, uh, just the simplest, is a positioning adjustment by uh, the service partner. So the service partner is gonna line up like normal, but as the returner is about to hit, service partner is gonna drop back into coverage. So those back up to like, let's say the service line in this case. They might even slide towards the middle a little bit in, uh, in the ad court so that there's more uh, overheads on the, you know, on the sword, so just a normal overhead and it's not over the backhand side. And they'll try and pick off anything that's a mediocre uh, a mediocre lob in that case. Obviously, if you don't have the greatest serve in the world, then villain will be able to hit better lobs. So if that is happening, if drop, so that's the first thing I would try, drop into coverage, right? And see if the service partner can get it. But you're gonna hold that move until they're about to hit so that they don't anticipate it. So that's number one. If that doesn't work, then I would use a play called the bounce overhead guy. This is a play Bob and Mike Bryan use all the time. So that lob is coming over here. And what you should do is you come over and get this. Uh, your partner is gonna slide over to this end of the court, and maybe backs a little bit or just kind of get out of the way. And you want to hit a bounce overhead off of this shot. So the lob comes in, you let it bounce, and then you're gonna hit this as an overhead. A great thing to do in this situation is actually hit like a kick serve or a slice serve, put a little English on that thing so it moves a little bit uh, and makes it really hard to judge. And after you hit that shot, and you can just drive it through the middle in this case like this, just aim for kind of a, a big target. You don't want to hit it at the net player, although if you put some slice on it or some spin, it's actually gonna be a tough volley. Just somewhere over there, your partner is gonna come back in and stand in the middle of the court because you're gonna expect a defensive shot and you want them to be able to volley it and pick it off. If it's a lob, in this case, they might be able to get it. But if they can't get it, then you do the exact same thing. Let's say the lob's just somewhere here. This person clears out. You let the ball bounce, hit an overhead, and, um, and then you basically rinse and repeat until, uh, until you win the point. But you're basically almost ending up kind of in an I formation after this overhead. So you hit the overhead and then it's I so that uh, this player picks off anything short and then you just repeat the play uh, if it gets over this partner's head. So that is how you deal with a, uh, a partner who, or excuse me, a, 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 an opposing team that likes to uh, lob you to death. So lob's a, lob's a tough one. Um, this one, that situation happens, I play with my dad, he's 80 years old, so he doesn't move. We play father-son doubles every week when I'm, uh, when I'm in town, but he doesn't move as quick. So the dropping into coverage one is actually one I use a lot. And uh, he doesn't move great to get over, so I actually have to cover this entire 
uh, side of the court. And I'll just run back and hit a ground stroke in that case. If I can't hit an overhead, I'll just run around, hit a forehand, um, and just kind of go from there. But, uh, but if, you, if you're quick enough, then definitely uh, use a bounce overhead guy. Bob Mike Bryan Staple. So that was from Nick and Catherine. All right, this is, a, this is a good one, too. So this is similar to what we did before. Is there a question? There is another doubles question. All right, cool. Uh, what are some key things to keep in mind when you're playing the Australian or I-formation doubles tactic? Okay, that's a good question. Um, let's do this one first, and then we can reread that one. Yep. Or redo that one. So you and your partner are one up, one back, and you're facing a team that is two up. So not a good situation for you to be in. Our friend Gigi Fernandez um, calls this situation the highway to hell because you're going to lose most of these uh, situations. There's a hole for uh, Villain to volley through, and uh, you know whenever there's a high ball, that the net player just gets killed. So to come to uh, combat this. What Bob and Mike Bryan do is uh, the baseline player is either going to hit a ground stroke over here or over here, like this, and try and hit a quality shot. That can mean with pace. That can mean a dipper. Uh, but just anything that this person can't, uh, you know, ideally has to pop up or doesn't hit a good volley. What you do not want to do is, and, and, and positioning for the partner at net is very important. It's basically almost on the tee maybe slightly to the side. But what you don't want to do is try and go angle cross court unless you're like trying to outright win the point because if you hit it too high, it's a volley winner for this player, right? This player, you've exposed their position by doing that. So what you're trying to do by hitting it middle or down the line is get one of these two players to pop it up so that this player can come over and clean up. Uh, uh, you know, they pop it up and then it's a high volley they can hit down. So this is a play you can use to, uh, to combat that situation. Again, don't expect to win most of these points. You're in it from a positioning standpoint, you're in a really bad situation, but this is how you make the best of a bad situation. So what was the question we had uh, before? It was... The question is, what are some key things to keep in mind when you're playing the Australian or I formation doubles tactic? Um, some key things, yeah, no, I know, I'm just I'm pondering the uh, so you're playing, there'd be there, you'd be here. And I'm trying to think this one versus versus Aussie because Aussie you probably wouldn't do it on this side as much. Um, <clears throat> this is this is a good one. So, well, why don't we address this actually in two parts? First of okay. all, are Aussie formation and I formation the same thing? No. And then. That's part of that's baked into this question. So okay. Let's address that. First, okay. Then talk about maybe one tactic for each. I'll talk. I'll talk. Yeah. Let me let me just talk about the I, and I'll explain that, and then uh, we'll move on to Aussie. So you and your partner are in the I formation. In this case, we're talking about the uh, deuce court, and the I, if you don't know, is just it looks like an I, right? Um, you know, like there's the letter I. Uh, so you're kind of in that line versus being like that, which is the more standard. Uh, standard formation. And this is a great formation to use if the returner is killing you with a cross court, uh, cross court return because you're now taking it away with this player. Now the thing to keep in mind is at our level of play we tend to not have the biggest serves. So what can happen is the serve gets hit and then both players make their move and tip their hand when the ball is like bouncing. So this player has plenty of time to adjust their shot and, uh, and uh, you know, hit to the open court or, or uh, you know, often actually going kind of back through the middle is a pretty good one when you're returning. But I digress. So what you wanna do, this player's gonna be crouched down. Crouched down. When the ball goes over their head, they're gonna stand up. Maybe they kind of creep forward a little bit like this, but they're gonna hold their move, whether it's this away or that away, or just staying there until the returner is swinging to hit. 
So again, at our level, at the club level, if you're playing with a partner or you're the server and you don't have a big serve, you need to delay the move. If you're serving and volleying, you need to move forward and then break one direction or the other. And if you're serving and staying back, it's similar. You kind of got to hold it. You might take a step or two in one direction uh, or the other, but you got to hold that move to make it, uh, to make it effective. And typically the, the place you'd want to serve on the, uh, on the uh, deuce court here is, is T-serve to cut down the angles. And then you know, the ensuing shot like this becomes more likely for your, uh, your partner to be able to pick off. Um, so those are some, some things to keep in mind when you're playing the I formation. And now we can move on to the Aussie formation. We're going to do it out of the ad court. So the Australian formation, one thing, one way this formation and uh, this play is great is in the ad court. And the reason why is in a normal configuration like we've got right now, what you get is a lot of shields, right? Heroes down here and everything cross court, you've got a shield uh, volley in the middle, backhand volley, tends to be the weaker volley. It's coming over uh, to the shield over here for the server. So by playing the Aussie in this case, you can actually reverse that. So the Aussie is where the server would stand near the tee and the service partner actually stands in uh, the service box over here. So you're taking away the cross court, but everything here is now a sword. So this is great, particularly if either you or your partner has a really weak backhand uh, shield volley, which you can often see at the club level. So what you can do in, uh, in this instance, basically, is server would serve, and whether they're serving, serving and volleying or serving and staying back, you know, serving and volleying, they'd come over here, serving and staying back, they would just move over there. But again, everything they're hitting is the strength. If the ser serve is directed at the shield, that's great because it's the weaker shot. Everything's going to be tailing back this way, so uh, easier, uh, easier, you know, the ball's coming right to you. And if you want to serve this ball uh, T instead, serve it here, what that does is actually allow your partner to poach. Because now, um, particularly if the returner's partner is somewhere here, the cross court becomes tough because you might like hit, the partner might get hit. So this, a T serve here is actually a great way to get the service partner involved with a, um, with a sword volley somewhere here where they can go and kind of just clog up the middle of the court and put that next ball away. So this is a great, uh, a great play to use in, uh, in the ad court to just go from hitting a weakness to hitting a strength. Also great if what you normally do isn't working. It's, a, it's an excellent, uh, excellent change up because um, it's such a massive, uh, frankly, such a massive change up. And again, you go from that weakness to the strength. So I would definitely encourage you to use, uh, use the Aussie formation in the ad court. So it was hopefully that answered the question. Let's see, a couple more, I can't remember. this so a question about uh, senior doubles so we're gonna say down here that uh, and this is our team hero down here hits a lob that gets over uh, the net players head so the net player goes back to get this thing and uh, this player, the server, will say, comes up to the net. So the question is, where specifically should these players be standing? They're almost virtually going to get relobbed. 
Um, so you gotta take that into account, but they're not, almost, they're not always gonna get relobbed. So what do you do in this case? So the formation you wanna use is a formation uh, taught to me by Gigi Fernandez, 17 time Grand Slam doubles champion. So remember, this player over here is hitting that next shot. So you wanna use a formation called the stagger. And you're not gonna stand in line with your partner. Your partner, the cross court player, is actually gonna drop back a little bit. And the reason why is because the cross court lob is the most likely lob in this case. It's the safest shot for a uh, uh, villain to hit. And this player is the one you want playing it. If you let this ball go over and this player has to get it, you know, senior is not necessarily as quick, but at all levels of the game, this ball is tailing away. So you have to run this thing down. It's just not going to happen. So what's going to so what you want to do instead is drop back slightly even though you're giving away some court here so that the ball doesn't get over this player's head now a lob down the line could certainly be uh, likely as well so maybe you stay like a step or so inside the service line again it's going to depend on exactly how quick you are but if they don't hit a lob if instead it's kind of like you know a shot that's low at your feet what you would want to do is just kind of scoot your next shot back over the net like that and have it land low. So you pull this player back into the court and you force them to hit up on the tennis ball. Because from there, with both players uh, correctly positioned at the net, now you're not worried about a lob. They're going to have to hit up, so you will be able to hit down on, uh, on that next shot. So the trick here, again, and and... I'll point out if the ball's over here on this side, then the stagger would be reversed. So this player would be back slightly, this player would be up slightly. But uh, you know the trick here is to not uh, to not expose yourself from the relob from a court positioning standpoint. And then if they do hit it at you, don't try and don't try and do too much with the shot. Just kind of get it back over the net, keep it low, pull them in. You know you, they've just run back for an overhead. And now you're kind of pulling them in for a drop shot or a short ball. Um, so they're going to be doing a lot of running, probably won't hit a great shot, and then you can just hit down on uh, that next ball. So that is, uh, that is how it handled that one. I think that's all the pre-submitted questions. All the live questions. All the live questions. Man, we got very, everybody's working very hard, <laughs> not, uh, not working on their tennis games. We'll give, it, we'll give it another hot second while I erase the board to, uh, to field a few more questions. If there are any. Where'd that marker camp go? Oh, it's over there. All right. Silence. All right. Well, uh, due to the silence, uh, we're going to wrap it up tip, uh, for today. But thank you so much for uh, tuning in. As always, these are fun to do. Hopefully, they are helpful. So, you know, leave a comment below. Let me know if there's anything else uh, you would like to see uh, related to this stuff. But thank you for taking the time out of your workday to tune in and be sure to watch the uh, Washington Nationals as they march towards the World Series starting this Friday against uh, the Arizona, or not the Arizona Cardinals, St. Louis Cardinals. Wrong sport, wrong sport. Anyway, with that in mind, it's Professor Hamilton signing off. We'll see you guys in the uh, next live training. Have a good one.